Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Lure, and today we're crossing the globe again and landing in New York City to catch up with Harpreet Singh Rai, the CEO of Aura, of Aura Health, the health ring, I guess is the best way to describe it, and we'll obviously go much deeper into really what it's all about, but uh, some of you might have heard it. I'm a customer. I wear it too every day, and uh, so I'll be sharing some of my own personal experience about it. And uh, but uh, first of all, welcome to the podcast, Harpreet. Marcus, thanks a ton for having me on. Uh, excited to be here. Yeah, looking forward to it. Looking forward to our discussion. Uh, to as usual, dig a bit into your background and your stories. And then, of course, we'll spend some good time talking about the company and, and the amazing growth you guys have seen since it started. And, of course, particularly over during COVID and, and how you know, that, that whole industry has really exploded. Uh, maybe the sports tech side of it or the health tech side of it is just incredible. And you guys are right at the, at the cutting edge of it. So uh, I'm really looking forward to learning more from you. Uh, I've seen and, and read quite a few things. Uh, I think at one point in time, I have saw your perspectives of, or, or your, uh, your investor decks as well. So I've seen a little bit of insights there, which is great. And, you know, so we'll, we'll but we get into all those things in a, in a while. But let's get a bit started into your, your, you know, how it all, how you got to the company. Um, it, is, it wasn't your traditional route, I would call it that. And so let's let's have a good look at that. Um, you know, coming out of college, you know, and then it, first of all, you obviously ended it, landed at Morgan Stanley as an analyst. Um, you know, what did you study exactly? And, and uh, you know, talk us through the first part of your career here. Yeah, um, it's a it's a good question. Um, I'd say yeah, most. Yeah, we'll apologize to all the listeners already now. There is a little bit of background noise. Let's see how we work with it. Cool. Um, thanks, Marcus. It's 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 a good question. I think um, you know, for myself, uh, you know, I, I I actually studied electrical engineering in college. Um, you know, my father was an electrical engineer, as as was my grandfather. Um, coming out of school, I think. Um, you know, frankly, I, I wanted to live in New York City. I grew up in New Jersey for the most part. My sister was or you know, older than me living in New York City. And that's where I wanted to be. And, you know, it was the financial boom at the time, 2007. And I think, you know, luckily because of that, there wasn't really many engineering jobs, technical jobs in, in New York City at the time in 2006, 2007. But there was plenty of jobs in finance and, and there right. still is. Um, and so I think, you know, for me, lucky to graduate at that time, you know, did audit, you know, uh, a few business school classes um, and, you know, was able to actually get an internship the previous summer investment banking. And yeah, I did one year at Morgan Stanley in the M&A group in, in New York. Um, I ended up gaining 50 pounds that year, uh, almost a pound a week. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, 50 pounds doesn't look good on anyone, but I'm, you know, five, five, uh, on a good day. Um, and, um, I would say particularly, you know, I, I came in probably weighing, you know, 140 and at the end I was 190 just in a year. And it was really because, you know, frankly, I, my health took a hit. Um, you know, I probably was pulling all nighters, you know, once a week, um, you know, where you just wouldn't go home. You would just not sleep and just keep working. Wow. And I think the lack of sleep, um, really, and just being sedentary is frankly what led to my poor state of health. And, you know, I ended up going to staying in the finance industry, went to a hedge fund called Eminence Capital, was there for nine years after um, Morgan Stanley uh, before Aura. And um, it, it was really it was a really great culture. Um, you know, it was really about balance, about making sure a healthy body, healthy mind. Um, and, you know, everyone actually was encouraged to eat healthy. You know, they provided healthy food um, for lunch every day. And, you know, we had a, a small gym in the office that, um, you know, everyone was encouraged to work out as much um, as much as they wanted to during the week um, and, and weekends. And so I think, you know, I ended up trying a bunch of different diets, a bunch of different, you know, things, you know, exercise wise. Um, you know, I was probably doing intermittent fasting back in 2009. Right. And uh, I think it was it was those things that really I ended up losing, you know, 60, almost 70 pounds from my peak. And I think that that really like opened up my eyes to how much health really mattered. Um, you know, not just for health sake, but for your life sake, you know, I was feeling better, was more productive at work, um, obviously more confident as a person, um, had more energy, um, you know, and, and long term health wise, obviously, it's much better for me, too. So I think that's that's really, you know, what drove a lot of my own personal interest in health and tracking and things like that. 
Mm. And so when did you come across, I mean, while you were at Eminence yeah, Capital, Eminence uh, Capital. Uh, while you were there, uh, first of all, maybe just a little bit, what, what exactly were do you guys were doing or what was your role there? Um, and then yeah, how did sure. that led to, you know, I think coming across the founders of Aura, right? Uh, was it you were looking at them from an investment point of view or, or how was, what was the sort of first pass of, you know, you crossed each other? Yeah, so at Eminence, um, I you know started as a junior analyst and analyst, senior analyst, and uh, my last four and a half years portfolio manager. Um, so of our of all of our tech, media, and telecom investments globally, mm -hmm. you know, seven billion dollar fund. Eminence has been around since '98. Um, awesome track record, awesome group. Um, you know, really low turnover um, at, at the fund, which is always something cool to see in that industry when that happens. Yep. Um, and so I got to I, I got to focus on my passion, right, which was tech. Um, right, I studied electrical engineering in in college, as I mentioned. And so, you know, whether it was investing in public market, mainly public market companies, billion dollar, normally you know five billion dollar market cap and up. So whether it was Google, Tencent, Fitbit, Apple, um, you know, had a global mandate to to look at a lot of these companies. I personally, because I was so into health, you know, and I studied semiconductor engineering, gravitated towards sensors. I felt like. These sensors, movement sensors, heart rate sensors, you know, these things inevitably um, had flows of information data streams that, you know, were going to be valuable to people. And my personal interest in health, that's sort of where that intersected. And so, you know, I, I ended up just always curious because I, I studied electrical engineering, specifically MEMS, which is a lot of the sensor design, you know, an accelerometer, a movement sensor was what I made in, you know, college as my senior design project. And so, you know, I knew all the sensor companies of the world and also knew a lot of the end market companies, you know, Apple Watch, Fitbit, Samsung, obviously, were some of the early players in the yeah. space. And um, I just used to try every wearable you could. I, I probably bought 20 different wearables. I guess. Okay. You know, most of them didn't work. They're <laughs> most Kickstarter, right, companies you never heard of. Right. Um, but, it, you know, most of them only lasted two to three weeks, you know, my wrist or finger. Probably went to two to three Fitbits, definitely went through two Jawbones. Um, but the Aura Ring... It was really the first wearable that I had used. So I was, you know, one of the early Kickstarter backers and users, probably in the first thousand users. Um, and I was just obsessed with it. I started realizing when I was tracking my sleep and specifically certain qualities before I track sleep on a spreadsheet, but never, you know, knew how much deep sleep or light sleep or even what my HRV overnight was or even lowest resting heart rate overnight was. Um, most of the other wearables didn't do that. But I started to realize and recognize that, holy cow, days I have higher sleep and readiness scores in the aura ring are days that I'm actually getting more things done at the office. Mm. I was in a better mood. And, you know, frankly, I was hitting PRs in the gym. Mm. You know, I've been working out consistently for eight years at that point. You sort of hit plateaus. And I started to recognize, holy cow, wow, those days that I had the highest HRV and the lowest heart rate and the best readiness scores, best deep sleep, um, I had a little bit better of a workout. Mm. And... Um, it was just the first wearable that I was really, truly obsessed with from a consumer standpoint. I also knew the advantages of the product from a hardware perspective of being on the finger. Um, you know, we looked at all the sensor companies. And so even the hospital, you know, every hospital takes your heart rate from your finger and your SpO2. And so there's a reason they do that. It's because, you know, the pulse signal on the finger is about 100 times stronger than the wrist. And I can get into that more. But how I met the founders was totally accidental. Um, I was using the product literally ran into uh, one of the co-founders in a grocery store. Um, my girlfriend is actually the one who spotted him. Oh, he was wow. wearing a t-shirt that said, Aura, and she starts talking to him and, you know, she doesn't have a ring. I'm wearing the ring. And then he sees me later because I'm like looking for her because we're, you know, trying to get out of the store. <laughs> and I see her talking to this guy and then I was like, oh, wow, that's the guy in the Kickstarter video as, you know, as I start to walk up to him and then I see his t-shirt on Aura. And he looks at me and he says, that's the first ring I've seen outside the office. Um, wow. and so he was like, this is the first aura ring I've spotted in the wild. And, you know, he was in New York city for two days. Right. We ended up, you know, spending six hours together the next day, you know, one coffee turned into two or three coffees and the coffee shop closed. Um, and, um, you know, I think they, they were trying to raise money. I, um, you know, they they were uh, frankly having a tough time. You know, the first generation ring was really big. Um, you know, we're in our second generation now. That's what most people know. But before we had a very big bulky ring. And it, the battery life only lasted about one night. And wow. Um, wow. yeah, and so it was very different um, product uh, appearance wise. It wasn't, you know, mainstream yet. 
But I, I loved it. And, and this um, is sort they of were just to raise... give us a sense of time here. We're talking about now what, uh, which year are we here? Two, this would have been 2016, literally probably May of 2016, about five years ago right, is when okay. I went back to okay. Because um, from what I remember, the, the company was founded almost, what, 2013, right? So at that time, they were already three, four years obviously into it, but before you guys ever met. Yeah, the Kickstarter, the company was started – um, probably, you know, started in 2013. I think it was incorporated 2014 was our official incorporation timeline. We ended up shifting, sh sorry, shipping the first Kickstarter units on Gen 1 at the end of 2015, okay. right? So I'm meeting them 2016. Okay. So you know, there's probably a year plus less after. than a, right. a thousand or 2,000 rings in the wild at that point. Right. Okay. And I mean, this is to just uh, step back for a second here. Um, it's a Finnish company, right? From uh, the, the founders are all Finnish. And so I'm assuming yep. the product com came out of Finland originally or were they, where were they producing it? Yeah, yeah, no, we were making them in Finland. We still do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have two production sites in Europe, um, but one of them is in Finland. Um, and yeah, we were, you know, half of our team is still Finnish. We're, you know, almost 300 people now. Um, we've been growing globally everywhere, you know, but mainly in the U.S. and, and Finland. All right. Interesting. Yeah. So, so, so you guys met, you hit it off, um, and how, how quick or how did you end up then joining them? Yeah. So I, they were trying to raise some money. Like I said, they were having a hard time. Um, I think it was just too early stage and hardware, you know, for most venture investors. And, you know, frankly, the product wasn't that attractive. You, if you saw it, you're like, man, not many people are going to wear that. It was just big and bulky. And, yeah, yeah, I think you know, I've seen like some that. pictures on uh, on the internet about the old one. And I, actually, I didn't realize that that was even it. I'm thinking, that looks so weird. <laughs> now I know why. Now, yeah. that, must, that was the old version of it. <laughs> but, but frankly, if you used it, you were obsessed with it because um, oh, you okay. saw a lot of value okay. um, and how it improved your life. Um, okay. So they were trying to raise money. They were having a tough time. I was so passionate about it. I personally invested in the company um, and led their Series A. Myself, um, another board member of ours at the time, or still still with us um, on our board, and you know, it was a good friend of mine from the you know another another different hedge fund. Um, so we both invested, joined the board. I think that was September of 2016, um, and you know probably by December, I was I was honestly spending almost more time with them um, than you know the the hedge fund I was working at. Um, and just, just hours in a week was probably working 80 hours a week, but just 40 and 40 on both. Um, and, uh, you know, the founders asked me to join, um, that November or December, of of 16. And, you know, I, I ended up, uh, and the board asked me to join as well. And then I ended up joining as president officially in May of 2017. You know, I was at Eminence for a long time. There's only five portfolio managers at the time and, you know, wanted to make sure that, you know, we, we, had, we were hiring a replacement, you know, we had someone, you know, that was ready to take on a lot of that work and um, wanted to make sure that they were in a good spot, you know, from a transition perspective before I left. Right, right. And so I left in 2017 um, in May. And then about a year later, um, the board uh, promoted me to CEO and it was really just helping the business and the team grow, um, you know, and, and did lean honestly pretty heavily on on even early adopters within sort of the biohackers, but started to cross over into some even early athletes back then. Um, so, um, that's sort of how, yeah, what happened and how I got involved in the company. Yeah, very cool. Now, uh, you're, you're the, the co-founder is, uh, being, uh, being Finnish. Um, what are they? They're techies or, or they're health uh, guys or what, what, what was it? What got, they've got into this? Yeah, I think, um, all engineers. Um, so, you know, really the first 15 employees you know, on the team were all engineers. Um, and I think, you know, Finland, if you look at it, there's a lot of interesting health tech companies out, out of there. Polar, you know, the company that makes yep. the chest wraps for triathletes. Right, right. Most people don't know it, but it's actually out of Finland. It's in the okay. same town um, that were, you know, our company started in Oulu. Um, okay. And it's, it's still where that either. Yeah. yeah. So I think if you look at Finland, you know, for a small country of five, six million people, they've had some remarkable technology breakthroughs. Uh, obviously, Nokia, um, you know, at one point, I want to say it was like, well over 50% of GDP yeah. for the whole country. <laughs> I'm sort of crazy. Um, but you know, uh, you know, sort of small country out of nowhere, really breaking into the mobile, you know, phone scene was, was the largest, you know, handset provider in the world um, for, a, a, you know, long point in time um, before Apple. 
And then, you know, I would also say Polar, right? Pretty in the 70s, that company started, right? Shipping, um, shipping sort of what I would call the first wearable, really. Um, so I think you had a lot of good signal processing, you know, telecom talent, a lot of good hardware talent, alongside a lot of really interest in health. Um, within within the culture there. And um, as a result, I think, you know, the real interest was like, hey, we have to make a wearable that's main purpose is health. And health is not just steps. Um, you know, we started with sleep and we felt like sleep, you know, most people are getting less of it, unfortunately. You know, really good data showing that, you know, people have gone from sort of nine hours sleep down to on any given night in America, less than six hours, half the population will get less than six hours. Right. And if you look at the negative side effects of that, um, obviously poor athletic performance, but but frankly, increased risk of cancer, all your natural killer T cells that fight cancer are made in your sleep. Um, early onset of Alzheimer's, literally the toxin that, um, or, or the plaque, it's called beta amyloid plaque that develops in your brain is, is washed away during night when you sleep and it's cleared every night. And it's now been shown that lack of sleep, specifically lack of deep sleep, is linked to the early onset of Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, all your muscle repair happens in your sleep. All of your learning, your memory comprehension happens in your sleep. And so, you know, sleep is really like the fountain of youth for us. Yes. And all of us are, you know, half of us are, are not getting enough of it on, on any given night. At least the, the data says that in the U.S. Yeah. And that's, you know, now become a global thing. And so I think the idea of, hey, let's focus on sleep, probably the most, you know, overlooked thing um, from health wise, lots of people focus on diet and activity. Um, let's sort of focus where someone where people aren't. That's that's a large and growing problem. Okay, so that so that yeah, because that's sort of what I think Aura is always well known for, and, and I think even when you can say see read any of the comparison to to other rings or other devices, um, it's always like you know, Aura tracks the sleep the best. Right? That's always I think highlighted at least from what I can see. And so I guess that was uh, you know purposely done that way. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the product a bit more for before we get into of course some of the business and and some of the other fun things here, um, you know. Let's first of all, you know, for anyone who still hasn't worked this out yet, it is a ring you wear on your finger. Um, it has tracking devices inside, right? Um, so it, it can read everything from your temperature to your pulse to you name it. Um, but I know you talk us through this a little more in detail. Uh, maybe I'll talk about what the ring has component wise and engineering wise. And just stop me if I'm going too much and build up from there. Yeah, please. Um, so, um, you know, we have, if you look inside the ring, we have. Uh, Couple standard things you find in wearables. Um, we have LEDs. Um, you know, we use infrared, but you know, you see these on any other wearable right on your wrist. So they're blinking lights. Uh, infrared are the ones you actually can't see by by the human eye. Um, uh, you know, we then also have uh, accelerometer, a gyroscope. Those are used for movement. Um, you know, all wearables have those. Um, and then we have temperature sensors as well. We have three temperature sensors. Other wearables don't really have that. Um, haven't focused on it. But something we've we've always had in our product, even since you know shipping the early Gen ones in 2015. Right. Um, so we we use all of those data streams. So the, the LEDs are used for measuring your heart rate. The advantage here on the finger, like I was alluding to before, mm -hmm. your finger. Um, you know this um, when you walk in a hospital, it, you don't really think about it, but they're measuring your heart rate from your finger. Right. Why? Well, turns out you know if you look at your skin on your palm, the skin's very thin. Your hand's got that reddish hue. That's the blood that's so close to the surface of your skin. Right. So when you're trying to use light to measure that blood flow and shining these LEDs, you know, in our case, 250 times a second, um, 250 hertz, other wearables weigh less, um, more like five to 10 hertz most of the time for other wearables. Um, and they increase the sampling during workout mode to 50 hertz or so. But we can measure that at 250 hertz, which is a huge advantage. Um, that means a better pulse signal much better signal to noise ratio things that engineers look at um you know because of that faster speed we get a just clearer picture of that pulse and we use way less power because that blood is so close to the surface of the skin and you don't need that much power to sense it that clearly so that's really the advantage we took that data and we said hey let's focus on sleep first sleep is you know all the things we talked about people aren't getting enough of it has an impact no matter what on what you do the next day um, has long-term impacts on health you know, sleep, Matthew Walker says this, the author of this book called Why We Sleep, sleeps the, you know, world's best perf legal performance enhancing drug. Right. Um, you know, so I think, um, you know, our, our view is let's focus there. So we look at and we track sleep, um, 
you know, heart rate, heart rate variability all throughout the night. We can talk about that. A lot of sports teams and athletes interested in heart rate variability. Um, you know, and then we also track activity, movement, steps, estimated caloric burn. And we take those two data streams or those two scores and we actually create something called a readiness score. The readiness score looks at your sleep and activity balance over sort of the last day and last prior, you know, weeks. But then we also look at certain biometric data from the last night. What was your resting heart rate relative to normal? What was your, you know, HRV relative to your typical baseline? What was changing your temperature, your respiratory rate? And those give us more clues about your body on how you're doing that particular day. So we got this cool sleep data, um, you know, a history of you. We got this cool activity data. And then we look at certain, you know, biometric signals and we take the trends and patterns we see and we give you an overall readiness score that's really easy to understand. So it, it sort of interprets it for you and lets you know how ready are you for the day whether that means taking care of your kids and, you know, dealing with that, because that's definitely a full-time job for the mothers and fathers out there, um, you know, or you're going to play on the pitch or you're going to be in the boardroom. Um, it gives you an idea of like sort of how ready, how sharp you're going to be, how well prepared you are for the day. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm just on the app here. It's actually, you know, as I think I said earlier, I'm a user too. Um, I got it, I think about six months back, I think maybe Christmas last year. Um, and I love it. it. It is my first thing I do in the morning. Um, you know, I'll uh, I'll check. Uh, I upload. Uh, you know, the, the sleeping. Uh, I guess uh, uh, data and, and then have a look. Uh, um, and and, it, and, and I, it's always interesting. There's always something which I sort of have a sense whether I slept well or not, uh, whether I slept deep or not. But it's obviously the data then really shows me that. Um, the part where I I always get most shocked out of is. Let's say if I go to bed and in, 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 I'm in bed for seven hours, but it's actually not seven hours of sleep, right? You have potentially only six hours of sleep because one hour you're just rolling around and, and you're restless and therefore you, you, you're somewhat awake, right? And so it, that's always the part which I like the most is that, you know, in, before I had the ring, I always thought ah, I had seven hours, therefore, you know, I should be okay. Versus in reality, as I said, it might have been only six or, or less, right? Uh, depending on that. So I think that that's, I, I really enjoy this. I, I run when I, I wear it when I'm going to run and, and or do you know, other exercise. So, you know, I like using that to measure things. And um, so, yeah, it has become a companion uh, daily. I would say absolutely daily usage or, or daily checking in here, uh, which I guess is the whole point of it. Um, now, when you – but when you guys, when you started this, right, who was really the, the audience you had in mind for this? Was there already an audience? Are you saying, look, in reality, everyone needs it? Like you said, whether you're a student and you need to be fit for your exam or whether you're an athlete, you want to get ready for uh, for the big game or whatever. Uh, you're, you're uh, you know, someone else who has has a job to fulfill. Um, but is there, was there a target audience and how you started this when you, when you went out or how you started to get the first rings on people's fingers besides yeah. the usual early adopters like yourself who just kind of come across as because, you know, it's kind of, you know, that's the place you like, play, you know, playing in. Yeah. A great question. Uh, so the, the first, you know, because we launched on Kickstarter, right, the first adopters were sort of, you know, like you said, early adopters generally into tech, right? Mm -hmm. People are into tech tend to gravitate, you know, it's broader now, but in the early days of Kickstarter, it's like all these new tech cool gadgets that are coming out. Right. So that was definitely like the first, you know, early, early adopters. Um, but I think then, you know, right behind that were sort of these people that understood these things about health and wanted to use that data. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's lots of people out there that understand the importance of sleep. It's growing, luckily. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, what we sort of found them mainly in this biohacker crowd, Right. And I don't really personally like that word, you know, but but that is what they're doing. They're trying to hack their health. They're trying yeah. to say, hey, I don't need to wait till I see a doctor. Um, you know, I need to use data in order to make better health decisions every day. Every human's body is different. How you react to certain stimulus for every person is different. And I, I need to understand where I am so I can dial in my workout protocol, my diet protocol, my sleep and recovery protocol. Yeah. And so I think that is really where it started to go. And as it starts to go there, you know, then you have the people who are 
really leaning into this the most. I run these, you know, really now growing largely more mass market every every week, it feels, um, you know, going to sort of just general people who are interested in health and wellness. And then more and more research has obviously come out on sleep and the importance of it. Um, you know, some really great books published, Matthew Walker, probably, you know, Why We Sleep, but also Ariana Huffington coming out, um, you know, with her book and even Dr. Michael Bruce, you know, on the power of now and circadian rhythms. Um, and I think all of that awareness for sleep and frankly, more people having issues with sleep as we get more and more connected digitally, right? Always sort of on. Um, I think it was all those things that sort of just started to take it from that early adopter, biohacker, even pro athlete or SNC coach, sports scientist into sort of mass market audience. Yeah. Yeah. Now, since we're in the sports entrepreneurs podcast here, let's talk about the sports side of it, because you guys have some deals, right? You have a deal with Red Bull. Um, yeah, I've seen some of the ads on your Instagram account. Uh, but you also, I think you have a deal with the NBA where I think you're delivering, you know, thousands of rings to them um, across the teams, NASCAR, UFC. Uh, again, did they come to you after they realized what it does or you approach them? How did that sort of work? Yeah, um, all of those, um, and actually, right basically, on. all of our pro sports teams has been inbound. Right, um, okay. Yeah, we we actually haven't. We're just starting to build uh, an outbound, uh, you know, BD and sales team. I think, um, frankly, wow. because of that focus on the product and the quality of our data. Like, if you look at our our data and some of our research, we published, you know, that our heart rate overnight is ninety nine percent, you know. R squared or accuracy against an EKG. Mm. No other wearable's done that. Right. No other wearable. Apple hasn't done that. Fitbit hasn't done that. Whoop hasn't done that. Um, and uh, Saint Garmin hasn't done that. Samsung hasn't done that. And it's mainly because that that poor data quality and that high battery power they need on the wrist that they can't sample the data all the time. They have to extrapolate a lot. And so I think once S and C coaches realize that, um, you know, they started to be like, "Holy cow, the fingers." the best place to measure this data from. Mm. And I think also they started to realize, hey, the importance of sleep during COVID, um, you know, obviously these wearables are and, and have been even us been used before to see if you may be getting sick. But I think it's really the research, the quality of the data, the accuracy and our product, um, you know, how easy it is to use um, that people have really been inbound to us. But yeah, no, that's great. And, and it's interesting. Uh, so um, the product is the attraction in a sense, right? So it's not like what, what you normally have, you, you go out and you do a sponsorship deal or endorsement deal with an athlete, and then everyone else goes after it. It's the other way around, they read about it and go, I need one of those things, right? Oh, uh, yeah, I like that. That's, that's really interesting. Now, let, let's talk a bit about you know, COVID, you just, just touched on it for a minute here. Um, you know, you joined them, you, you know, the company is sort of, you know, growing and stuff and here, here comes COVID, uh, which obviously for many industries, uh, was, was exactly the opposite, but for you guys, it clearly from the looks of it, it and correct me if I'm completely wrong here. Um, it, it helped you to grow even, even faster because of that it does track your 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 temperature and and maybe even other measurements. I guess when you when you catch COVID, um, so it helped tra you know help people to, to feel more confident they either don't have it or or at least they maybe were aware of it. How did that impact and 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 what sort of uh, you know maybe talk talk about that for a bit? Yeah, again, I guess this was luckily for us already built into the product, right? So yeah. r really, every flu season, it's not just. COVID, it's any influenza-like illness. Right. Um, we've had users since 2016 reaching out to us saying, hey, I got sick and I found out, uh, actually they, they normally say, I thought my aura ring was wrong. It said my readiness score is like a 50 or you know, a 45 or something like that. Right. And I'm typically in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And, um, and it said my temperature was up a degree or my heart rate was really high and my respiratory rate was high. Um, so we've been hearing that every flu season. Right. I think during COVID, that just meant so much more. So, you know, there was a user who came out actually in Finland, uh, his name's Petri Holman. He made a, you know, really lengthy Facebook post about it, but there was, you know, probably hundreds before that emailed us. And, um, you know, he basically just said, I've had this product for a year. I use it every day. I check my data every morning, as you mentioned, like you do. And he was like, it said my readiness score is 54 and he's typically 85s, 90s. And it said his temperature was up a degree. And this was, you know, early, late February, early March. And he was like, you know what? I don't feel sick, but let me just in case go get tested. Right. And, you know, it turned out he was positive and, you know, he described himself as asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that happened and it was public. And now, 
you know, so many people are starting to be inbound, but we're already working with the researchers. And the researchers, um, because we have all this granular data and we have temperature data, along with heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate, the things that other wearables have, um, but our data's, you know, more granular there. Um, they they were pretty excited, like, wow, you you guys probably have the best shot of any wearable um, of showing, like, you know, potentially maybe there's changes in data before you're sick. And, you know, so we did what we always do. You know, we try to prove it in research. We, you know, ended up, you know, working together on a study with UCSF called Tempredict. Started with frontline healthcare workers. You know, we donated 3,000 rings uh, to frontline healthcare workers across the U.S., you know, and mainly in, in, in California at UCSF. Um, but, you know, we tried to get as, as many different hospitals and locations as we could. And um, then we opened up to our audience and, and we had 70,000 people sign up for the study, which is remarkable uh, for a company our size. And, you know, research was published in, in December, um, you know, showing that the first 50 subjects data were published and more is coming soon. You know, several hundred, if not, you know, almost a thousand now, um, basically showing that for, you know, three quarters of people, um, they're able to see changes in their data up to three days before they feel symptoms. Wow. Um, so it's not for everyone, uh, but it ended, you know, the data, the early data shown 90% of people see changes in their data at least a day before they feel symptoms and 10% the same day. So I think if you're trying to reopen a business sports league during the pandemic, right, uh, it was like, wow, you know, if people are getting sick and they can see it in their data before, if we can see it in their data before, then, you know, we can, you know, make sure they stay home, get a, you know, COVID test, confirm whether it's COVID or not uh, before allowing them back, you know, in the workplace. And um, so they don't, you know, spread this to others. And so I think that early data from UCSF is, is really what caused, you know, I think the NBA, you know, they were the first to really open in a bubble. Um, and, and, and that's, that's how that all started. And then, you know, sort of all the other, leagues and sports are trying to reopen then started approaching us yeah well the nba is a good starting point uh, they do the other, the other others do follow what they do and then clearly they're always at the, at the cutting edge of it which is great for you guys um, let's talk a bit about the sort of numbers and and the growth and and uh you know raising funds and all the fun stuff which comes with it here um i, I don't know whether you can share any numbers of you know in terms of where the company started to where it is now uh, in terms of revenue is there is there public data out there or um, anything you can share or how many rings you ship or what is out yeah there? I think we, we've said you know earlier this year we shipped over half a million rings um, cumulatively you know most of those were, were obviously in the last 12 months um, we've been doubling um, we've been doubling every year basically since inception. Um, so I think, you know, if you, if you just take, call it, you know, 500, half a million rings, you know, you know, $300, you, you know, you can start to back into like, sure. Hey, how much revenue does that mean? Um, you know, so I think, uh, it's been luckily, you know, really good growth and not just for COVID, uh, but for frankly, um, you know, it was, it was been doubling every year before since then. Right. Um, and, you know, I think publicly it's out there, right. You know, with that, we, we have raised a series C recently, um, you know, that was over a hundred million dollars. We, right. you know, raised a series B before that, that was public at $28 million. So I think that, you know, those are majority of the funding rounds were those last two rounds. But, right. and you got some big names there, right? You have Google there, you have Michael Dell, um, you have our friends here from Singapore, Temasek there, Shernan Group. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a broad group from, you know, really all over the world um, who are believing in your story and, and, and taking you forward. Um, are they just purely investors or are they also coming in as, let's call it, strategic and giving you guys access to markets or helping you grow in other ways? Or how do you normally bring investors in? Yeah. No, I mean, look, I think we want to make sure one that they love the product and they love where we're going, you know, really helping people understand and, you know, empower them to better health. Um, so, you know, uh, Square, um, you know, the payment terminal company, Jack Dorsey's other company outside of Twitter um, is also an investor. But yeah, they, everyone's been really helpful, frankly. I think Forerunner, you know, really experts in sort of consumer marketing, you know, direct to consumer marketing has been terrific. Uh, churn, as you mentioned, you know, uh, investors in sports and media, um, and also health, a lot of health companies, Tomasek, you know, lots of experience in healthcare, right, in Tomasek and globally, which we thought was interesting. Jazz Venture Partners, you know, one of our investors um, has a deep background in consumer health and um, you know, and typical medic, you know, medical type devices and and reimbursed healthcare. Um, Michael Dell, you know, I think he was sort of the first biggest investor for us in our Series A. Mm -hmm. um, he's been fantastic. Obviously, um, just a terrific human. 
Um, they've been super helpful in helping us understand and how to scale our supply chain and our hardware. Um, you know, they obviously figured all that out yeah. quite some time. Um, so yeah, luckily we've had a great group of people who've been supportive across, you know, consumer, marketing, sports, health, hardware. It's it's been a it's been a, a great group. Yeah, amazing, I love it. Now let's let's talk about where, where do you see you know what's the next step because clearly, and it, you know currently if I if I'm correct is the the way to get the product is it's purely online right it's, it's not i walk into a shop and and i buy it somewhere right physically okay correct I, right? yep just online it's, um or ring.com right and that and you're shipping globally or is there still countries or, or yeah regions no we we ship to anywhere in the world 100 yeah we shipped to 100 countries we've been you know global from from the start right, um right, and yep. we have actually different language support in the app so we support japanese german spanish finnish um obviously that was the first you know language we <laughs> we added next to english yeah. um so yeah and we'll, we'll be constantly trying to you know, keep keep localizing and making the app more accessible. Right, right. And and so currently, your biggest market would be the U.S. or which part of the world? Yeah, I think for the wearable market as a whole, you know, U.S., North America, Canada are, are the biggest markets. You know, probably followed by you know for us Europe and Asia. I think Asia has actually grown quite a bit. Um, you know, I think China obviously, we, um, but but also Japan. Um, Hong Kong, Korea, Taiwan, um, Indonesia too. I think um, you know, growing populations, growing GDP. Um, people are starting to care a lot more about health. Right. Yeah, and because I mean, just I don't know whether you mentioned it. you mentioned three hundred earlier, right? I think that's your starting price, right? Which is your let's say your 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 starting ring two nine nine, right? And then it goes up to nine 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 for the more fancier version. Um, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, we have that diamond version, but but yeah. really, it's two ninety nine to three ninety nine, depending on the That's finish right. and color. That's right. Yeah. Um, which is, I feel it's reasonable. Um, you know that that's that's. It's not a, a you know, massive expense for, I think, uh, the, your average consumer, I guess, around the world. Um, so I think you, you are in a great spot there. Um, wh what's beyond that? You know, I mean, where else besides, of course, getting this on every finger in the world, which would be a you know, good starting point um, from a half a billion now, uh, sorry, half a, half a million rings now to, you know, whatever, millions of rings now. Uh, but is, are you looking at other products or, you know, extensions of it? Or, or where do you guys see really? Is it just... Just first yeah. of all, just get it on more of hands. Yeah, look, I, I worked, you know, in 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 finance at a you know investment bank and a hedge fund. So I think I sort of try to think, you know, big picture and, and sort of top down and, and then also, you know, smaller picture bottoms up as an operator. Right. So I think top down, if you look at the market, the wearable market outside of earbuds and connected speakers, really health-based wearables, risk trackers, and you know, companies like us, you know, on uh, smart rings or whatever, you know, whatever some people call it. Yeah. Um that's about 200 million units now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at IDC, I think they're sort of the best. You know, it's roughly about 200 million units grew. You know, nearly 20 percent or more last year. Might have been been more, um, but it's been growing. You know, 10 to 20 percent sort of every year. Right. Um, and if you look at smartphones, smartphones, there's a billion shipments every year. Right? We're, it's right. been pretty steady now, so we're sort of in market saturation for smartphones. Yeah. Um, you know, most people can afford one, have one. I think wearables go from 200 million units to that same penetration for smartphones, you know, mm. um, a billion units a year. And I think the reason is because these have evolved from step trackers to now tracking so many things about your health, yeah. right? Um, you can track your sleep at the quality, nearly, nearly the quality of a sleep lab. You can track your heart rate and heart rate variability and respiratory rate to the quality of an EKG. That's so much value. You know, I mean, to do that in a hospital or a doctor's office or even just a personal trainer, you know, a training session at a gym like Equinox here in the U.S. or some of the other ones are, you know, 100, 150, you know, maybe, but they started, let's say, $50 mm -hmm. an hour. You know, so you do two training sessions a week and you're, you're getting into the price of an order. So I think these wearables are delivering more value and the more health features that keep getting developed, you know, sleep, certain things with an activity, but frankly, illness, women's health is a big one. We actually done a lot of work on um, fertility, had a great paper published, um, you know, back last year on just sort of showing how the data can be used to, to track sort of LH surge for women or even, you know, period prediction for women right, and knowing you're going to have your period a day or two before. But, you know, frankly, I think, think about things like, you know, heart attack, stroke, infection, um, sleep apnea. I think I think there's so many more use cases that these devices can be used for. For frankly, understanding your health, 
And the more and more value you deliver there, and the more and more features of, of those that keep getting developed by the industry, I think consumer adoption is just going to increase. Like, what would you pay, you know, to understand your body, your health, and your life? I think you know consumers pay a lot of money there, and this is this is a small amount relative to actually what they spend on health today. Absolutely. Yeah, no. As a consumer, I uh, I could I would totally agree with all the things you just said. Uh, it, it's uh, it's just invaluable data which you just never had in your fingertips. And and I like the analogy with the uh, with smartphones because at the end of the day, you do need one or you don't have the data, right? So you can well, I guess you could could you upload it? I guess to your lap to your computer as well. But if you don't have it. If you don't have a smartphone, you probably won't have a computer anyway. So uh, yeah, so, yeah. So it's it is the smart device um, and the connectivity to that. And as you said, as that grows and as you know, the whole world will eventually have one of those. Um, yeah. Why, why wouldn't they have a ring which goes with it? I get it. Uh, yeah. So I think look, you'll see us, and I think you're seeing others in the industry do that, right? Um, Apple has pushed pretty hard on AFib, you know. I think, um, but there's many, you know, cardiac conditions, and you know congestive heart failures to heart attack and stroke that I think are interesting or, you know, even hypertension and blood pressure. So I think the more and more of these health features that come out, the more and more consumer adoption will grow and awareness will grow. And you're going to see, you know, our revenue, but also the whole industry's revenue increase. Uh, completely. Uh, yes, I think you guys are in a nice, in a sweet spot there, uh, which, you know, and, and looking at our time here, I, I know we, we got a bit of a hard stop, so I want to make sure we, uh, we get there. Um, so what's the next? You you raised a bunch of money. Uh, we've got you know have blue ship investors behind you who uh, you know not just providing the cash but also clearly providing I'm sure very very good advice uh, and 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 other directions. Uh, what's what's next? Is it listing? Is it a spec? Is it uh, you know just keep growing on your own? What what do you see the company heading? Yeah, I think. Um... Frankly, just trying to grow, you know, whether we're grow the team, grow, you know, new features, um, you know, I think um, many different things that uh, that, you know, we need we can we can and are doing right now. So, you know, whether you're public, private, owned by another company, you know, I, I don't really well, judge those opportunities as they arise. Um, you know, SPACs are definitely things that have made it easier for companies to go public faster. I think there's some benefits to that. And I think, it, uh, you know, we've clearly seen some, you know, drawbacks to that. I think, you know, some SPACs have gone, you know, sort of lost most of their value as publicly traded companies already as well. So um, I think, um, uh, I, I just think that uh, it, it's it's for us how it happens, you know, we'll, we'll take it as it comes. Luckily, I think there's, you know, options on all of them. There's people who were like, hey, can we invest and lead your next round? You know, I think there's uh, other people who were like, hey, let's do SPAC, let's go public. Um, uh, someone was telling me that yesterday. Uh, uh, and he's like, I've been telling you guys that for six or nine months. And you know, I think there's others who are even interested in acquiring the company. But I think, you know, we're going to do what's best for consumers um, to make sure they're getting most value from us. And so, you know, whether that means we, we're IPOing soon or not, you know, who, who knows right now? Too early to tell. Right, right, right. Uh, and again, maybe that's a, again, I'll leave it to you how you can answer that. Uh, is the company profitable already, or where, 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 what stage are you? Yeah, we, we, uh, we actually haven't said anything about that, um, you know, but I think um, uh, there is, you know, some stuff out there on that probably uh, in the interwebs. But I think, yeah, we're, we're uh, frankly way more profitable than, than probably you'd think for a startup our scale and growing. But, but, you know, we raise this money to invest. I think hopefully we can find really attractive areas to invest it in uh, that can develop future growth. And, you know, whether we're profitable or not, I think is, is sort of irrelevant. But um, I think we're, we're happy at what we've done so far. Yeah, yeah but, uh, but if, you know, making money is always a good start. <laughs> so you don't need necessary investment to uh, to keep growing that way. Yeah? You can use that money. For, yeah. for other Look, I mean, and... I, 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 it depends, right? If you if you if you talk to Jeff Bezos in the first 15 years of Amazon, he would tell you, actually, you know, he never was profitable then, yeah. um, you know, that it was, hey, investing capital that eventually can provide a higher future rate of growth was actually more interesting. Um, and so he would, you know, if he found areas to invest in the business, he'd keep doing that because he's like, this is going to lead to longer term value, more permanent value, more defensible votes. And so I think about it that way too. But yeah, I think, look, having a good business structure 
So the revenue that you're making is high margin that can fuel investments into the business is, is how we think about it. So we think our gross margins are, are actually best in the industry. Um, you know, and I say that knowing that Apple's gross margins and Fitbits are public. Um, and, um, you, you know, I think um, we feel pretty good about that, but we're also finding equally as good. And, you know, what I'm even more excited about is areas to invest in that can provide even more growth and value to consumers in the future. And I would guess there's, there's basic scaling, uh, uh, cost of scaling, right? Like the more rings you guys produce, the lower the per unit probably drops in some sense, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, uh, I wish it dropped faster. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. Yes, I'd, I'd say general law of volume helps you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, okay, we got a little, couple of minutes left here. And, and as usual, it all sounds like everything worked well uh, and was perfect, but that's probably never quite the case, right? I'm sure there were moments um, uh, when you joined or, or even prior to that where it wasn't always working. Either the technology wasn't working right away or something, you know, got messed up the supply chain or whatever but uh, do you have an example of that where the company you know had challenge and, and how did you guys overcome it no oh, man i feel like you know there's challenges or you could use this word problems daily hourly yeah absolutely. exactly <laughs> i mean you know yeah. and, and you know is that exactly. you know guys way past the startup stage but uh, you know even at the stage you, you know, especially when you grow that fast you know you will that, that the growth by itself creates the challenges right yeah i think the way we get through that, frankly, is in our mindset and our mentality. I think, you know, one of our value in our values, you know, so one of our values is solution focused. Um, so for every problem that exists, right, think of not just one, but three solutions. And we sort of say this, our CEO says this a lot, is like, imagine if every email you got or every Slack message or every text was, hey, here are three solutions to this problem. It just gets your mindset in hey, what's the answer here? What's an answer we can all agree on? And then how do you get everyone to agree and, and move forward? You know, we one of our other values is Ubuntu, um, you know, and I think that's, you know, how do you work together as a team? You may not always agree with each other and that's fine. You shouldn't, frankly, it, it actually, you want that healthy tension, right? But eventually we need to disagree and commit and we need to be open with each other and we need to do what's best for the team and the company. And, you know, that's the spirit really of Ubuntu. Um, and I, I think it's, it's really that mindset you have with the team and, and I look at, at problems is, and, you know, uh, things you have to figure out is learnings, right? The faster, just like a student, you want to take more courses. You want to learn more, right? You don't want to be stagnant. You want to take the next level course. Does that mean you're going to get some problems wrong in the test? Absolutely. But if you didn't take that course, you wouldn't be learning. And uh, I think as a team, as a company, um, as an industry, it's tackling those problems with that kind of right mentality. Just just like, you know, you're on the pitch, you're down 1-0. What do you do? Um, great hockey game last night, you know, the Islanders versus Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay's right, reigning champs, mm. uh, same division. You know, they um, tough team to play in the playoffs, right? And they were down 2-0. The players didn't quit, right? Yeah. They came back. Like, how can we actually win? right? Like, what's your mindset? You got to skate where the puck's going. You got to think creatively as a team and, and move forward. So I think actually, I, I, I feel like I draw a lot on from sports analogies there yeah. and how you can overcome problems and how you can learn from that. Absolutely. Uh, sports, sports analogies and sport metaphors are my favorite. Um, that's my world. <laughs> uh, and I love the Ubuntu uh, uh, metaphor. Actually, one of my guys that used to work with us, uh, he's from South Africa, and, and he used that all the time. And yeah. for, for the ones who are not sure what that even means, it's basically called, it means that humanity to others, right? It's sort of like, you know, I am what I am because of who we all are. Um, so it sounds like you guys yeah. are using that as, as, a, as a mantra or, or as a as a guiding uh, principle within the company as well. Yeah, totally. And, and to build on the sports metaphors, um, actually, I, I think I was pretty inspired um, by that, you know, when I watched uh, the doc documentary, The Playbook. Uh, it's on Netflix. For those of you who don't know, it's interviews with, you know, four really well-known sports coaches. Um, the first one was was with Doc Rivers, and it's produced by Maverick Carter and LeBron James, but it's on Netflix, so yeah. a lot of people can watch it globally. And it's it's great. He talks exactly about that how the Celtics used um, Ubuntu in their championship run. And, and it's, 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 you know, every life is expressed eventually through another, you know, through the lens of someone else. Right. And, and so every, every life is a life through another life. And so that idea of, you know, humanity um, it's, it's really well, well told in, in, in that episode of the first episode of the playbook with Doc Rivers. Oh, nice, nice, very nice. Uh, great. Well, that was just a very nice way to finish off as well here with a bit of Ubuntu, <laughs> which is, I, I don't think we had in any of the other podcasts. So this is brilliant. Um, 
Harpreet, thank you so much for your time here. I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, I think we nicely sharp on the hour and uh, let you get back to your your day there in New York City as it's just starting uh, while I'm wrapping up mine here in Bangkok. Um, I, I think we just managed the, the noise level there pretty well. I think uh, luckily your, yeah. your neighbors are, uh, kept quiet. Um, so thanks for your time. Uh, it was fun. Uh, and again, best of luck with everything you guys are doing. I'm a big fan of the ring. Um, and uh, as I said, go check it out. It's Aura, which is O U A R dot com, I believe. And O U R A. O U R A. Sorry, I don't know. It's misspelled it even. God. Uh, it's we'll, late we'll, your time. Exactly. <laughs> we'll make sure it is spelled properly in the in the podcast. And uh, like I said, have a good one there. And thanks for your time. Uh, Marcus, thanks so much for, for your time and, and having me on. And, and frankly, thanks for doing what you do. I think getting this information out there, you know, keeps helping others learn about health, the industry, sports. Um, and and I'm, I'm glad that people like you are, are doing that. So thanks. Thanks for having us on. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Luer Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Luer. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.